necessity of animal research. If you want to have cures, if you want to have medical advances, that must be done ethically uh, with an animal model. Uh, to a few of you in the room who uh, uh, really want to become a physician, a physician's assistant, a PT, an OT, uh, something medical or paramedical, you may have a prime training opportunity, even if only a matter of months or a couple of years, uh, to really uh, solidify what you do in clinical practice by first learning some of these uh, concepts medically and physiologically in an animal model. And then really for everybody in the room, I want to remind you since most of us are born in the world of human-based research, uh, what is really important is that even if you don't become an animal researcher, it's still very beneficial uh, for you to delve into the animal-based literature on occasion to really understand why it is that exercise is medicine perhaps. And so that's my key message for this talk. And so to do that, I'm gonna give you a quick outline. And uh, essentially what it's going to be is I wanna very quickly overview the ethical considerations of animal use. And then I want to give you what is the relevance of the exercise model? Is, is it relevant to humans? It, are the disease models that are studied in animals relevant to humans? And then how clinically relevant are they? And really what I want to emphasize for the final main point of the talk is that the discovery comes post-mortem. You do an animal study, it's almost invariably going to be a lethal um, outcome for the animal. But it's after that point that really separates animal research from humans in that the answers that can uh, be learned from these animal studies. So let's begin with these ethical considerations. But most of you haven't had me in class, but those who have know that I really like The Onion, uh, the satirical newspaper, and for whatever reason, over the recent years, The Onion has picked up on this divide between the animal rights movement and then you know, the need for animal-based science. And what I'm going to do with it, what I'm going to do point out is that I think there's a strong misconception in the world about what animal rights is, and that's really where I want to start today. Animal rights is different than animal protections, and so many of you may be familiar with the Institutional Review Board, which oversees ethical considerations of human research. There's an animal arm to that at every university or even every hospital that conducts animal research, and it's the animal, or it's the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, or I Cook, kind of book shown on screen. There's also uh, federally mandated protections for animal use, and this is integrated with an international uh, emphasis on ethical uh, use of animals in research. And so protections, wanting animals to be protected and used ethically is completely different than animal rights. Animal rights, and I don't mean to be insulting to anybody in the room, but animal rights really is essentially saying the Bill of Rights applies not just to people, but also to animals. And I'm referencing uh, a paper from the physiologist from 2005, and it's still to this day the most powerful brief description of the difference between animal rights and ethical use of animal subjects. And I'll give you a couple uh, quotes from that here. Essentially, to ascribe rights of animals to animals would result in human subjugation uh, to animal whims and instincts. I, I, if you think about that philosophically, it's, it's completely true. Animals will do what they do, and it's different than sentient, high-order beings. Uh, the other point to make here, it's bulleted, the animal rights debate isn't about torture, but whether it is proper to use animals for human benefit, if it is done so ethically. And so I want to very quickly consider what is animal rights about? People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, is one example. I want to clarify, my mom, when she was alive, was, an, uh, was a PETA member. Uh, she wasn't a protester. She wanted animals to be treated ethically, and she didn't know the difference between animal rights and animal protections. Uh, so she'd send them 20 bucks every six months for a newsletter. But uh, here's what animal rights means at the core. The, the f uh, founder, Ingrid Newkirk, uh, says, animal research is immoral even if it is essential, meaning to humans. And if an animal research produced a cure for AIDS, uh, we'd be against it. Uh, as a philosophical process. A different animal rights group founder uh, said this quote, 
If the death in one rat cured all diseases, it, would make, it wouldn't make any difference to me, saying animal research should not occur. And, and so that is what animal rights is about. And I don't think that is how many people who, uh, the, who defend animal, uh, the animal rights movement, I don't think they fully understand what the philosophical underpinnings of the movement are. Uh, here's a picture from the PETA website. You'll note that there, you know, there's a fluffy kitty cat, it's adorable, there's a whale, and, uh, and essentially that is different than any animal testing experience uh, I've ever known. I've known hundreds and hundreds of researchers. I have yet to hear of, uh, personally, of, of a direct instance of animals, animals being mistreated or misused in the research process. It does very rarely occur, and we have the protections in place to make sure that the right things happen. Uh, going back to the onion, uh, the animal rights uh, movement, uh, also not representative of my mom, but do occasionally fringe on uh, terrorist behavior. Here's the real message. I'm going to leave you with this. If you want to have new medical advances, you have to have animal science. The alternative is to substitute humans as the guinea pigs, as it were, in place of animals, and understanding that for every FDA-approved medication or treatment, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of failures conducted in animals, uh, leading to the ones that might work in humans. And so keep in mind, if you don't approve of animal research, uh, then we're going to have to substitute humans or uh, forego any future medical advances. Uh, here's an AP APS, American Physiological Society, a group that does a lot of work on uh, animal rights. Uh, there's their protest stickers, you can, if you can read them. Uh, Jesus loves me too, it's a chicken. Uh, meat is murder, fish are friends, not food. I think they stole that from Nemo. The, the, the American Physiological Society, I've juxtaposed with that, a card that, that I don't think the APS thinks uh, animal rights uh, protesters are going to use, but it says essentially, I believe that animals should not be uh, used in scientific or medical research. If I am unable to speak for myself, meaning they found this card in somebody's wallet, then do not treat me using any medical science, meaning don't treat me. And, and that's sort of a, a way of sort of emphasizing uh, this philosophical conundrum. So I'm going to end that portion of the talk, but uh, I'll direct you to these uh, websites, and I can give you those later if anyone is interested, including the American Physiological Society, which is the professional organization that's perhaps done the most public awareness on this topic. So with each section of my talk, I have uh, some sort of uh, gratuitous Montana uh, you know, outdoorsiness uh, thrown in. These are mule deer that ended up in my front yard. They were hungry and they came down a couple winters ago. So let's talk about the animal models for exercise. And essentially with this silly first slide, what I want to do is make the case that animal exercise and human exercise while not a, a, one is not a perfect surrogate for the other, can ultimately be equivalent scientifically. And the first, the first slide I'll show you is some uh, rats exercising on a rat treadmill in, in my lab. And I want to point out that we use the FIT principle for rats. And in fact, FIT VP. You know, I, I work with an ACSM just as much as you. Uh, frequency, intensity, time, and type. And uh, you can see it's it's just scaled down uh, for the rodent. Sometimes it's a mouse. Uh, here's a former doc student who's now a faculty member at the Washington State Health Science Center in Spokane. Uh, it always seems like when you first put a rodent on a treadmill, it's kind of cute, and little tails wiggle. Uh, it's really boring. Um, and it may be not unlike uh, human exercise. That watching people exercise is sometimes boring, except with the rodents, it's even more uh, mind-numbing in the sense that they don't talk to you. So let's consider, if we want an animal to exercise, and we want it to be equivalent to what humans do, well, let's make a checklist. So we need to identify, can animals also be sedentary? Uh, can they exercise spontaneously, if they are sedentary? Uh, do we, can we quantify the VO2 response? And then uh, the fit principle. And finally, we need to address the fact that if you put a mouse on a treadmill, it's usually electrified which means it's forced exercise, and that's scientifically uh, problematic in some regards, so let's discuss that as well. The first figure I'm going to show you highlights male and female exercise trained, or sedentary, if you will, rodents. For the course of this talk, all the exercised are going to be highlighted in green, and all the sedentary will be highlighted uh, with the red line, and this is a survival curve, meaning over the course of the animal's lifetime, which is an obvious advantage to an animal model, uh, 
they will eventually, like humans, uh, die of old age. And what you find is, is that if you give them access to running wheels, uh, they will use them and they'll live longer. And there's it's, uh, new data they're starting to suggest that uh, humans also live longer when they exercise, and that's sometimes been debated. But as, as you know, as a first case for whether or not animals can be sedentary, I present this data. You check that off the list. Let's consider spontaneous activity. Here we have the animals in the, the, the cage. You put a wheel in, and as I said, they will run. They don't necessarily run exactly like humans will. They don't take, you know, they don't take their heart rate, and they don't necessarily do it in 30-minute bouts continuously. But they will accumulate the same amount of exercise that we would prescribe them. This, this, this very busy table comes out of the Tim White Foot Lab, and what he's done in the days past is he tested all the different main varieties of, of mice that, that are available scientifically. And all these mice have names that only scientists could love. But if you take the average mouse, the garden variety mouse, if you will, called a C57, and there's actually variations of that, but if you just take that mice, among others, and you put a, a wheel in their cage and say, all right, mouse, run on it or don't, and then you record precisely what they do, over the course of a day, they'll end up running a certain number of kilometers. And it turns out that when I, when I told you that we apply the fit principle to mice or rats and scale it down, uh, what they will do on their own is exactly the same dose that we would prescribe them in an easiest and prescriptive type sense. And that is very validating in the sense that uh, we do have sedentary behavior, but this is something the animals would do of their own volition. So we want to know what is the VO2 response. And it turns out a mouse and a rat won't let you put a nose plug on their nose and a mouthpiece in their mouth. So you have to put them in the mouthpiece, as it were. You put them in a chamber. Uh, that means you can only have a peak VO2, not a VO2 max, but it can still be done. You can put the treadmill also in this chamber and run them at higher speeds, maybe higher grades. And this has been done many times. And in fact, you can buy this equipment commercially. So here's one from Columbus Instruments, for example. We've done this in my lab. I just went ahead and took a human metabolic cart, and so that's a mouse treadmill down there. There's a mouse. I went ahead and got some Tupperware and made my own mixing chamber. It took about three or four iterations in my garage, but I did it, and we were able to do pretty, pretty good resting and low intensity metabolic rates with this MacGyvered device. But since we know what the metabolic response is, we know what the intensity response is. Let's first talk about the frequency. These data come out of the Scott Powers lab where I postdoc and first really jumped into animal research on a day-to-day -day basis. These are animals, either exercised or sedentary, that were exposed to a heart attack. Again, the exercised are in green, the sedentary are in red. What you'll notice is that between these dashed lines, that is a surgically induced heart attack, an, an infarct. And uh, the key dependent variable is peak systolic blood pressure, so meaning does the left ventricle continue to beat like it's supposed to during the heart attack. And what you'll note is that with, in the exercised animals, and the point of this is four days per week, they mostly maintain their left ventricular function during the heart attack, where the sedentary animals do not. So case in point, uh, there's a benefit when you exercise the animals the same number of days humans would. What about exercise intensity? Well, we also did a study when I was in the Powers lab where we exercised animals at either 55% or 75% of their known VO2 max and then gave them heart attacks and compared it to sedentary animals. And what we found was that the key dependent variable is recovery of cardiac work, meaning 100% on this chart is a perfect heart. Anything below 100% is damaged. And what you'll note is, is that the sedentary hearts have a fair bit of damage, but Exercise at either moderate or vigorous intensity uh, largely preserved that deficit during the heart attack. And this is important in the sense that even moderate intensity exercise is beneficial, but it confirms that we can uh, accurately uh, prescribe exercise intensity uh, in an animal. So what about uh, the time duration? For this, I went ahead and looked over about a 20-year period the number of exercise rodent studies uh, related to this topic, exercise and cardio protection. And I just went through each of them and averaged what is the time duration that was applied. And it was all within the ACSM criteria of 30 to 60 minutes, and emphasizing that, in fact, all these studies, all the conclusions that we derive from these animals uh, are really based upon an ACSM-type exercise prescription. 
Well, what about type? Um, I've described you treadmill running and rodents. Uh, that's certainly popular. There's also swimming, also cardiovascular exercise. Now that has some problem with, problems of its own, and we can talk about this after the talk. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we can prescribe different modes of exercise to rodents and to, to larger animals as well. So finally, let's remind ourselves about the forced exercise. There's an electrified grid in the back, and if Mr. or Mrs. Rat or Mouse doesn't want to run, they, they'll go to the back of the treadmill, the electrified grid will give a very mild shock to their tail, which by the way, uh, we went ahead and put our fingers on the grid, and you can feel a shock, but it doesn't hurt, it just alarms. And in any case, uh, we need to know, does that change something about the animal? And in one sense, there's been a very validating study where uh, the cardioprotective effects of spontaneous exercise were examined, and what they found was that sedentary or exercised animals spontaneously exercising, meaning given access to a running meal, were still cardioprotected, presumably because they performed the dose, the ACSM type dose that I described earlier. The metric here is the time of onset of a, of a lethal or potentially lethal ventricular arrhythmia, like VTAC or VFib. So the higher the bar, the better it is. It means that the more time it took for the heart to experience VTAC or VFib. In this case, it took longer in the exercise shown in green versus the sedentary shown in red. So since they will exercise spontaneously, uh, there are metabolic cages where you can measure daily expenditure using indirect calorimetry. Those are about a quarter million dollars for eight cages. Uh, one of the things we've done in my lab is to use a survey, and I got this from my pedagogy uh, colleagues, where we essentially just describe the ambulatory and non-ambulatory -ambul activities. It's called an ethnogram. You essentially just say, what does a mouse do on an average day? And put it in the, the typical categories, and then you just mark them off every 15 seconds. And in fact, we know the metabolic rates of these activities, so we can actually describe what we might loosely call mouse meds and get a sense of what is the metabolic activity of these, of these animals uh, while they're in their cage. It turns out that we've done this in our lab with heart failure uh, mice of different strains and with different treatments. We found that this approach, which is also applied in humans, uh, is very sensitive to differences in physical activity on a daily basis. Muscular strength and endurance. Let's not just talk about cardio. Well, it turns out that you can do muscular endurance, in this case, uh, climbing ladders, uh, mice and rats, if you put them at the bottom, uh, they will very quickly climb up something. And you can even, you may be able to see in this image, there's some weight attached uh, very carefully to the, to the rat tail, as it's shown here. And they can, that's the way they can increase the load. Uh, here's a muscular strength test, where essentially you have a very, very precise, small force transducer. And you just, you put them on, their little mouse claws hang on, and then you, you just give a very gentle tug on their tail, their back end, and at some point their, their, their mouse forearms aren't strong enough to hang on, they let go, and you can measure how much force. But you can train them or have disease models and different training regimen that would be applicable to humans and get a sense of uh, how these animals respond. What about muscular power? I have some cutesy uh, 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 illustrations and Photoshop images of, of rodents doing Olympic lifts, but it turns out this can also be done. Essentially what you do is provide a very modest amount of uh, uh, food restriction and then train the animals to recognize that, oh, if you do a rat or mouse squat, uh, then you'll, you'll be rewarded with the food that they want. And it turns out that over time, you increase the resistance, and these animals will lift multiples of their body weight uh, to roughly the same percentage of uh, humans in the, the, who become good in the weight room. We can also have muscle function in vivo and ex vivo. And I have an illustration and then an actual uh, device uh, shown up, up top here. So this would look sort of like a, a leg extension device. In this case, it'd be an anesthetized animal. You'd stimulate the nerves and, and have the animal kick and figure out how much force uh, in a variety of different uh, exercise, uh, you know, a, a different uh, experimental paradigm. Another example is you can take out the hind limb, you can take out the calf, if you will, or in this case, the soleus of an animal, and then keep it alive in an artificial buffer that's you know, kind of like bathed in a nourishing non-blood solution, and you can figure out how well it will contract. 
Uh, but these are still muscular contractions, and you can simulate an exercise regimen, uh, uh, measure fatigue, force production. And you can take the muscles out and isolate the single fibers and figure out how much contractile strength there is in a single fiber, uh, very similar to humans. In fact, here is an image uh, through a surgical scope of a single fiber tied on to two glass probes attached to force transducers, and you can electrify and stimulate the muscle contraction and measure the force. So with these silly, here again, the onion, with these silly figures, I'm going to close on this topic that I do believe, and I hope I've convinced you, that humans and animals can't exercise. Uh, it, it's never a perfect one-to-one -one match, but uh, using a number of different uh, methodology, uh, you can equate human exercise in a rodent model. This being the transition, there's a picture of my wife on the Nez Perce Trail right hiking near the house. I think this is a valuable picture in that the Nez Perce have hiked this trail. This is not a, a, a recently created trail, but rather it's been there for eons. And in fact, people are careful not to maintain this trail because it was first trod upon a thousand years ago. Lewis and Clark took it many years later. So let's talk about disease models. Uh, do we have good animal disease models? Where no experimental model or animal model is perfect, the answer simply is yes. And again, the onion steps in, uh, you know, suggesting that, you know, uh, sarcastically, that uh, you know, everything that could possibly be studied has been done, but we know that's not true. Uh, we can expose them to pollutants. Uh, they can spontaneously or be a lifestyle, be a fat, sedentary, uh, lipidemic, since I work in cardiovascular, I want to show you this consideration, not just for rodent models, but for larger mammals. So it's mouse, rat, pig, rabbit, and dog. And you can see that there's a cost-size ratio. But relative to cardiovascular disease, shown right here, we have heart failure, cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, then the L is for lipids or dyslipidemia. And the good news is, is that we have these models in all major types of mammals that, that could be tested in the lab. Uh, anatomically, they're at the very least good, often uh, excellent relationship to humans. And obviously an, an animal that looks different from a human, and people point this out as, well, how could anything discovered in a mouse equate to a human? But I want to show you this far right hand column. The first number is gene equivalence, meaning do mice and rats have the same genes as humans? And the answer is yes, 99% of the time. And that, that is why uh, pharmaceutical research has begun often in, in uh, mice or rats and then carried up to humans once it's proven efficacious. Uh, the middle one is gene homology, meaning when the gene is constructed, how much how similar is it to humans? And there it goes down a little bit. You're still somewhere between 95 and 85 percent. And then finally, the sequence homology, the, the alphabet, if, as it were, uh, of constructing the gene to the protein can be quite different. You can see that's where the number differs, and admittedly, that's why not all animal research directly translates to human, but uh, it still gives us some idea. So if no one mouse or no one type of uh, rat perfectly equates to humans, how do we solve that problem? And uh, I do what many others do, and that is we don't just look at one kind of mouse. I showed you the Tim Lightfoot, the whole series of 20 or 30 different types of mice. Well, for one type of study that I've been examining for the last uh, maybe seven or eight years with a collaborator on the animal sciences at Iowa State, Josh Selsby, we've had four different uh, grants to study heart failure and looking at mitochondrial biogenesis as a way to uh, mitigate the, the problems. Uh, we said to ourselves, well, what are the models of muscular dystrophy? There's one that happens to be called MDX, and we, there's some different names to them. And we've tried to characterize them. We and others have characterized them and, uh, on severity, and it turns out this mouse over here, which is a double knockout, and it is, it is it's so severe it doesn't actually uh, recapitulate human disease in any way. This one over here is the most commonly used. It's almost <laughs> too mild. It really doesn't equate to very many people with muscular dystrophy. This one's getting closer. We've recently uh, taken on some studies in another. So the point is, it's, it's true that no one animal uh, perfectly replicates the human condition. So what you do is you triangulate, sort of GPS style, the experimental sense. And you measure multiple animals with similar outcomes, and you try to get a sense of what you can safely 
a transfer as knowledge that might equate to humans, and then what cannot? And we often find what doesn't translate to humans, and we cross that off. So in these animal models that we want to equate to human and cardiovascular disease, um, I, I'm sort of reminded of the Saturday Night Live skit, having been born and raised in Illinois, of the, the super fan Chicago who would say the Bears, which means like, only resonates with older people in the room. But I want to have a checklist here too. Do we have the metabolic syndrome animal? Do we have that sort of heart attack waiting to happen animal? And the answer essentially is yes. Let's first talk about, there. just an example, there's a rat that actually takes most of these off, and it's not the only type of animal. It's called the JCRLACP rat, which just means corpulent is CP. It's fat, and it's lazy, and it has dyslipidemia, hypertension, atherosclerosis, obesity, uh, hyperglycemia, and it infarcts spontaneously. There are many rodent uh, models and non-rodent models uh, that meet these criteria. I've already discussed that there many are, are anatomically similar. At the very least, they're, they're good anatomical exchanges. And finally, uh, do we have senescence? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's very convenient that mice will get old somewhere between 12 and 24 months. It means you can study them on, on a very efficient time frame. Uh, and, you can, and I put in this little silly image to remind us that we can feed uh, these animals a Western diet, and it turns out they often respond like humans do, which is to say cardiovascular disease. I don't work in cancer, but I want to remind you that there are many other diseases that are that, that are uh, examined in animal models. Sometimes it's a spontaneous cancer. Other times uh, they'll, uh, they'll be injected. In fact, we have someone in the room who's, uh, who trained in northern uh, Colorado and, and uh, looked at uh, cancer outcomes in rodent models. If if you are a training PT, OT, AT physician, physician's assistant, you may say, well, what about neurological diseases and injuries and models? And there's too many to describe, but at the University of Montana, for instance, we have a device that can very precisely give a concussion to a rodent that's anesthetized, and uh, it, it kind of looks gruesome. Uh, there's a sledgehammer that will uh, be set up, and it'll pound on this little uh, mallet, and there's a water tube, and the animal will be fitted on the other end, and that's where the force will be very precisely transmitted through the water and delivered to the, the, to the cranium. Um, there's spinal cord injury models, and you can see here's a paraplegic um, mouse. Uh, there's also muscle wasting. Uh, this could apply to casting to uh, somebody with uh, cachexia related to disease or aging or maybe space flight. You may say to yourself, oh, I wonder, these, 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 these models look brutal. They are, but keep in mind, none of these experiments are conducted with an animal in such a way that it suffers ever. Uh, that, that's paramount. Um, but keep in mind, uh, until we don't, until we no longer have people with spinal cord injury, uh, we may need these models to help solve uh, these problems. Uh, a colleague of mine, Andrew Shanley at Appalachian State, has uh, developed this muscle contusion model again for the ATs, PTs in the room, uh, where essentially they deliver. Uh, a light force, and it's essentially, it's a marble in this tube, and you can see that the hind limb is, um, is, is uh, essentially hit by the force very, very reproducibly, and it equates to about 75 pounds of force being delivered to the thigh, like imagine a football athlete. And the final animal, animal model I want you to consider is exposure, and this is uh, also at the University of Montana. I'll admit that I'm actually transitioning back out of animals for the time being, but if I do the next animal study, it'll probably be cardiovascular related to exposure in, uh, to, to wood smoke. And in this case, uh, we, have, uh, we have an air inhalation facility where wood is burned and then delivered to the animals in the cages. So there's my son pointing to our house from a from a snowshoe out of the house. So are these models clinically relevant? And the simple answer is yes. Here's a picture of me in cardiac rehab, a brown-haired version of me uh, that, that event right before I started the doctoral program. And um, essentially, I want to essentially take you through, I was going to save a little time. And essentially, that was just a cutesy uh, animation of the animals being anesthetized. But here's 
future physicians in the room, when we do these heart attack surgeries, we ventilate the animal, we anesthetize them, so you need to know the pharmaceutical usage, and we measure EKG, we measure pulse pressure within the animal, and then tie off the left anterior descending coronary artery. Uh, I, I don't have to hopefully explain to you why this is valuable, even if you don't want to uh, do animal research as a career, how valuable this sort of model can be in terms of intensive care uh, training uh, prior to the actual medical practice. I have some pictures. This is the, the RICU, the Rat Intensive Care Unit, two rats having heart attacks. What you'll notice on screen, here's the ECG up top and the corresponding pulse pressure down below. Here's the normal, that very fast rate in a room. There's uh, the bigeminal PVCs, VTAC, VFib, systolic pressure drops. Uh, it's, it's very uh, similar to humans. Here's the mouse intensive care version of the same thing. Uh, just to wow you with this video, this is this is a mouse heart during the heart attack, so this is just the ligature that's tied. The mouse head would be down here and the tail in this direction, and that's that's the heart through the very small thoracotomy uh, to again widen the LAD. Uh, here's a, another brown haired version of me in the Scott Powers lab doing isolated perfused hearts. The benefit of this, it's clinically relevant in the sense that in this model, we control preload on this end and afterload on that end. You can measure cardiac output with a $2 beaker and a $5 stopwatch. You just catch what is pumped from the heart and time collection. Uh, clinically relevant, we can actually take uh, vascular sections out of a rodent and tie them up. It's similar to the isolated heart or the isolated muscle. Figure out what's happening there. Uh, and when I was at Auburn University, I spent tens of thousands of dollars measuring MRI function, cardiac function, and high uh, strength magnets. So here's the, the the short axis and there's a long axis, two chamber view. Those, those are either, I think these are in mice, but we did these in rats as well. Uh, when I moved to Montana, uh, we continued the heart failure work. This is my wife Tiffany uh, doing echocardiography. Uh, you'll see if you've ever looked at these in humans, it looks the same in an animal. The only difference is there's an anesthetization process. And so as we consider heart attack damage, all the things that happen in humans happen in animals, and we can measure them, including changes to the EKG, changes in myocardial function, and we can measure uh, tissue damage, just like in humans. If you're interested in biomechanics, uh, gait analysis can be, exam can be examined, uh, as shown here. There's very sophisticated devices. Uh, maybe someone with a, uh, an animal that has a neurological condition that replicates humans. Here's, uh, this, this is plasmography to measure pulmonary function in animals, uh, which uh, we've done many times. It turns out that you need to examine about 15,000 breaths, but if you do that, you can understand tidal volume and ventilation. Here's an example of uh, PET scanning for cancer in rodents, just as an example. It turns out that there's enough demand for this that very, very high-end uh, CT and PET scanning and other types of scanning exist. So, uh, all the clinically relevant outcomes are, are at the fingertips at any major uh, medical institution in the country. Uh, here we are at uh, Glacier, just north of us. You're all invited to come visit. <laughs> so, the final point I want to make is that the real discovery, the reason we must have animal models, is that we need to understand why something is different and why that could be uh, translated to therapeutic condition in humans. And in the exercise world, I have a schematic that essentially shows exercise as a stressor up top and an outcome, cardio protection or heart attack resistance on the bottom. Everything in the middle, which you maybe can't read, is just the cell signaling cascade. What's the point? The point is, if you want to know why exercise is important, not just that exercise is medicine, but why exercise is medicine, you need to systematically, experimentally, alter these things in such a way that if one of these pieces you think is part of the exercise and cardioprotective response, take it out, and if protection is gone, then you say, aha. I illustrate that here, where we have a, a nebulous marker of heart damage shown. Uh, the sedentary heart has a lot of damage. Exercise has less. If we can take that same exercised animal, but add or remove one biological factor at a cellular level and observe a difference, again, that's our aha. That's factor X responsible mechanistically for why exercise is good, why it is medicine. One of the ways we do this during the heart attacks is we just infuse a contrast dye into the blood, turn everything blue except the infarcted part of the heart, 
and then we figure out what's going on. Here's an actual picture. Uh, if you can see, there's the, the massive infarct, apical infarct, and everything else is blue. Well, we can just dissect away what's pink versus what's blue and compare each heart as its own control. What I'm showing you now is a Western blood. Uh, it's just protein isolated from these different tissues. Everything you see in blue is from all the different treatments, exercise, sedentary, or control treatment. The point is they all look the same as they should. They didn't have a heart attack. Well, then we look at what did have a heart attack. It turns out if the bar goes higher, it means that protein was changed in a, in a pathological way. But exercise, it turns out, pre prevented that. We're able to not just demonstrate exercise or different exercise treatments were different, but using each heart as its own control. That's something that couldn't be done in humans. We can also do histolo beautiful histological staining, and this is just showing that we can use fluorescent microscopy. These are on exercise uh, rat hearts. But the point is, if we if we take a, a cue from some of the heart failure work we've done recently in my lab, with, with light, or in this case, fluorescent microscopy, we know that in heart failure, the, the cell walls of the heart muscle change. And we want to know, how do you build a stronger heart? When you build a stronger wall, so that, that's protein. And so we're just looking to see, do these proteins co-localize, as it said? Do they turn up at the cell surface at the same time? And in this case, we were able to demonstrate that they did. Uh, Chris Ballman, who's now a faculty member at Sanford University, did this work. And uh, he was going to go to medical school. And uh, you know, he started in a weight room. He was a big guy. He was more the you know, legendaries for leg day shirts. And uh, he turned out to be a fine uh, biomedical scientist. Uh, and who knew? Uh, light microscopy, in this case, I just want to show you uh, from a similar series of experiments, we were looking at fibrosis of the lower limb, which is tr uh, common in muscular dystrophy, and we're able to link that all the while to fatigue curves. The point being is that in the same mouse or in the same muscle that you measure uh, exercise function, you can then go in and measure across the entire muscle, which is what you get is the entire cross section. You could look and see uh, how, how it works anatomically. We can also take cells out, culture them, that's primary cell culture, we can te technically do this in humans, and then we can uh, look uh, through all sorts of sophisticated means like confocal microscopy, which is really just three-dimensional microscopy, sort of. And in this case, it's myonuclear domain in a normal versus pathological condition, the point being is that the, the ratio of nuclei spaced out uh, to the rest of the muscle uh, can be uh, deleterious and, or, or good. I also want to highlight that in this modern day, molecular biology and genetics has been applied to the world of exercise. This is also from Chris Ballman after he left and uh, was a postdoc at UAB Medical Center. He did some work saying, oh, well, we know that mitochondria are good. PGC1 alpha it helps to build more mitochondria and muscle. Let's knock the PGC1 alpha out of those muscles and see what happens. And in this case, this is just showing you that he could compare to the normal mouse where everything makes the mitochondrial biogenesis signal, you can genetically alter them. In this case, it could be a knockout, and you genetically alter it so it doesn't produce that, and you don't any longer see that gene product. Well, then you link that to exercise function. Or you can knock in. In this case, a specific protein has been knocked in. This is myosin heavy chain, and you can see in the same animal, uh, it's knocked into one leg and not the other. You see those commercials like where the guy has one jacked arm and one skinny arm? This has actually happened in the animal model. It's very, very telling in terms of musculature. You may have heard of CRISPR-Cas9 or gene editing. Uh, this is shown on screen, relates to the heart failure and muscular dystrophy, but the point is uh, these, uh, these sorts of technologies are now being applied in animal models to answer exercise-related questions in some of the So as I wrap up, I want to say that over the last 15 years, when I really got into the uh, Powers lab and started doing a line of research, what I started in his lab, I carried on into my lab at a couple different universities. And what we collectively discovered, meaning the Powers lab, my lab, and then a number of other labs, including Russ Moore at Colorado, Dave Brown at Virginia Tech, the part of that ECU, uh, Joe Starnes at the University of Texas, he's now at UNC Greensboro, we collectively have demonstrated that exercise protects the heart by turning on a number of intracellular factors. Going to my lab, I wanted to know, are there any receptor chemicals 
that will activate these responses. And while we never actually got a, 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 a pure connection between the receptor and then the effector, what gets turned on biochemically, we did demonstrate this end and that end. And so it was done in animals, but essentially it applies to humans. And what we found was that both the heart and the skeletal muscle produce different chemical factors after just a couple days that tell chemically, if you will, tell the heart, the receptor-based pathway, be protected. Well, I'm not doing this work anymore. I thought I would, I'm not. Someone that needs to connect what's happening here versus what's happening there, if you can do that, uh, you'll probably be as rich as you are famous. So, in closing, here's, here's where I really want to end. Each of us, I think, should be reading on these animal models. And in this case, we have a research continuum from most applied to least applied. So you have pure reductionist, basic science on the left end, where meta-analysis and clinical trials are on the right end. And this is what most of us do, and that's perfectly fine. What I'm saying is, you should be, know your area, be experts as, as you, you are. But every so often, you may need to, to branch out and read up on these animal models, or even just cell culture models, and, and get the tidbits. Because we're always inclined to say, well, I understand what, you know, if you do something preclinical, I know what this means to a meta-analysis, but you should also know the why. And I think that, for most people in the room, is the big take-home message. The final point I want to make in terms of reading the literature, taking an example of Chris Baldwin that I've mentioned a few times, uh, the work that we did over a bunch of different studies was essentially, can we manipulate PGC1-alpha and mitochondrial biogenesis uh, with a dietary manipulation? We did that, we documented it, and we used these animal models, which is the point I'm talking about today. We used different kinds of mice, and this is, this is just a schematic of the study design over 14 months. MRI is where we did the MRI function, and then we compared it to different strains of mice because we were triangulating the different strains, and when it was all said and done, we also did respiratory function. We took uh, the mice, we exercised them, we measured their activity, we looked at their muscles, uh, took them out and contracted them. We looked at, so at the hearts, at the muscles, and then when it was all said and done, we did a lot of Western blots, a lot of histology, a lot of biochemical analyses to answer questions. Well, here's where I'm headed. On Netflix, there's a, a movie called The Fundamentals of Caring About a Boy with Muscular Dystrophy. And early on in the movie, they actually go to his medicine cabinet to see what he's taking, quercetin. Well, that's the, that's the supplement we've been funded for four different uh, grants to examine. And if you look on PubMed, uh, Selsby and, and my lab are the only ones to do this. The point being that um, the parents have apparently have been reading our research enough, the, the non-scientist parents have been reading our research enough to find this as a potential solution, so much so that it became a you know, a brief reference in a pop culture, you know, in a movie made about the topic. But that at first kind of hit my ego, and then I was immediately humbled. I don't know if this works in humans. That's why you should be reading this literature like the parents to figure out, well, if that works in humans and you are a PT that works with muscular dystrophy, uh, get that clinical trial going. So with that, I want to thank uh, the powers who got me my start, Dr. Dunkey and the invitation. Uh, Cassie, who's running for uh, student rep, is in the audience, uh, as is Catherine, my wife Tiffany, our dog, Barkamedes. <laughs> so, thanks.